in the deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, I'm sorry, the Federal Reserve <coughs> Bank of uh, San Francisco. Uh, that would be one billion out of these uh, 42 billion plus of reserves. And we do the same thing for every other bank that's a member of the Federal Reserve System. And the grand total is uh, 42 billion plus. That's uh, further uh, uh, standard money. Now, uh, when we subtract that remaining standard money uh, from the checking deposits, uh, we're left with 1967 billion, and this represents uh, the fiduciary media. This is the amount of fiduciary media. This is the amount of claims to standard money payable on demand uh, by the depositors, the transferable claims, claims against which they can write checks, but for which there is no actual standard money. Well, what is there uh, if there isn't standard money? Uh, the banks have assets, but what's the nature of their assets? Yeah. It's other people's debts, uh, so uh, they have that. Now, what sorts of, uh, uh, how, what can you say about this in a little more detail? Uh, they have some of their assets are mortgage loans. Uh, others might be uh, government securities. Uh, they may have uh, different IOUs of, on various types of loans. Uh, they have marketable securities, uh, most of which are uh, fixed income uh, type securities. I don't think they have any significant uh, stock holdings, if any. Uh, so they've got various uh, securities and uh, customers IOUs. Now, what I have here is an illustration of, uh, you could take it as an illustration either of a bank or of the whole banking system. And uh, we've got assets over on the left, uh, liabilities on the right. Uh, I'm showing standard money reserves of uh, 42 billion. Uh, checking deposits, uh, I hope the, the number squares with what I uh, arrived at a little bit, a little while ago. Uh, I'm taking the checking deposits as uh, 1987 billion. Uh, they have loans and investments of 1975 billion. And they have bank premises. That's another one of their assets. You add up the grand total of the assets, we have uh, uh, 2,022 billion, two, a little over 2 trillion. And the liabilities are equal. But only a very small part of this is uh, capital and surplus, uh, 35 billion. Now what happens uh, if uh, something occurs that reduces uh, the value of the assets of a, of a bank or the banking system? Uh, let's deal with a bank first. Uh, suppose you have a bank that has a significant number of mortgage loans in its portfolio and uh, uh, some of the uh, debtors uh, are unable to continue their payments. So they've stopped making uh, payments on their mortgages. Yeah? Well, the bank, uh, if the payments are not made good in a fairly short time, uh, the bank can foreclose on the mortgage. But if this is any kind of significant development, uh, what do you think will be uh, the price at which they'll have to liquidate uh, the assets against which they issued the mortgages? Less than uh, there'll be a, a, a drop in price, and uh, the banks could very well suffer a loss uh, on that item. And to the extent that the value of their assets would be reduced by such a development, what's the effect on the uh, cap capital and surplus? That's equivalently reduced. So would it take, if we view this as an individual bank, suppose we were stating this uh, not in thousands of billions, but uh, suppose we took it as uh, 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 1987 million, that's a, a good sized bank, uh, almost two billion dollars uh, in checking deposits. Uh, how much of a drop per percentage-wise in the assets in the loan and investment portfolio would it take to wipe out such a bank's capital and surplus? I would think, uh, le uh, yeah, le on the order of uh, 20 percent, that would certainly do it. Uh, if the capital and surplus is uh, 35, uh, well, it should be even less than that. Uh, 
10% would be 197 and a half. Uh, 2%, it seems like. Uh, if the assets fell uh, just 2%, 1% is uh, 19.75 billion. 2% uh, would be 39 and a half billion. Uh, that would wipe out the capital and surplus and create a deficit of uh, over 4 billion. So uh, the banks are very, very highly leveraged and a relatively small decline in the assets of a given bank uh, is capable of wiping out its capital and surplus. Now, what happens uh, if there is a bank uh, that uh, ends up in this position? And historically, uh, this has happened on many occasions. Uh, imagine that uh, it's Friday afternoon, uh, you're thinking of uh, picking up your uh, dry cleaning, uh, uh, had you gone there, uh, you would have written a check, uh, paid for the dry cleaning, and walked out with it. Uh, but you can't make it to the cleaners. You figure, okay, you'll wait till Monday afternoon or Monday evening. But uh, when you wake up Monday morning, it turns out that the bank at which you have your checking deposit uh, has been closed. Uh, the examiners have found that uh, the assets are deficient. Uh, the bank uh, has no capital and surplus. If the uh, dry cleaner reads the same news story that you do, do you think you'll be able to write him a check uh, Monday evening? No. 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 Now, until Monday, uh, your deposits were uh, the equivalent of money. We'd count them as part of the money supply. But what's happened when the bank fails? What's the effect on the money supply? What, what was regarded as the equivalent of of, uh, of standard money has lost that character. It's now, it now has the status of a highly speculative uh, junk security. Uh, you see, uh, what, would, what would a deposit at a failed bank be worth? You might find someone willing to uh, take it over from you, but there would be pennies on the dollar. Uh, you see, when, if a bank fails, uh, its assets will have to be liquidated and the depositors uh, will only collect uh, less than 100 cents on the dollar and who knows when. So uh, these, this part of the supply of fiduciary media loses its character as the equivalent of money. It loses its character as part of the money supply. So what's the effect on the quantity of money? The quantity of money is correspondingly reduced. Now, if you keep in mind the quantity theory of money, uh, what should we expect to be the effect on the volume of spending to this extent? Uh, that will go down. Now, uh, if this is any kind of significant bank, I mean, if it were a tiny uh, uh, itty-bitty bank in Podunk, uh, it might have no perceptible effects. But suppose it's a fairly significant bank, uh, what's going to be, and, and it has some impact on the volume of spending. Uh, what's going to be the effect on uh, business sales revenues and profit margins? Reduced. Uh, that'll be reduced. And what is the effect of that on such businesses uh, to keep current on their debts? Uh, they may have greater difficulty. And so uh, there's the potential there when you have a very, very highly leveraged banking system like this, uh, if uh, some uh, significant bank failures occur, uh, serving to reduce the quantity of money, and then cutting the volume of spending, and thus sales revenues, uh, cash flows, and thus the ability to repay debts, uh, that can cause more business failures, which in turn causes more bank failures, uh, with what further effect on the quantity of money? A further decrease. A further decrease. And uh, this represents, uh, this is the way in which the quantity of money can actually fall uh, and in which you have an actual deflation. Now, uh, exactly this process is what occurred uh, in the Great Depression starting in uh, October of 1929 and uh, running throughout the 30s. Uh, I, I don't know if we went into this. I have a nagging suspicion that maybe we had some discussion of this. Did we? No, okay. Uh, we got wave after wave of bank failures 
uh, in uh, 1929, uh, in October of 1929, the uh, quantity of money in the United States was reported as uh, approximately $26 billion. And the uh, GDP uh, for 1929 was about $104 billion. In 1933, the quantity of money had fallen uh, down to about $19 billion. That's seven billion off of 26 billion. That's more than a 25% reduction in the quantity of money. And that reduction in the quantity of money is the reflection of bank failures. Uh, the deposits of, of those banks uh, had been part of the money supply, but as uh, banks failed, uh, their deposits uh, lost the character of money and became uh, junk securities in effect. And as uh, one set of banks would fail, uh, reducing the quantity of money, that would serve to reduce the volume of spending in the economy, reduce sales revenues, cash flow, and the ability of those business firms to repay debt, and to the extent they owe debts to banks, more banks failed. And uh, we could have, the process could have gone uh, all the way uh, to the virtual wiping out of all fiduciary media. And what I want you to be aware of is uh, the uh, deflationary potential of this uh, kind of monetary system. Uh, we've spent some time uh, developing how uh, the expansion, how with the uh, fiat paper money, uh, there is tremendous potential for inflation of the money supply, the endless increase in the quantity. But it's also very important to realize that uh, a uh, paper monetary system uh, which represents claims uh, to uh, standard money has the potential for deflation. Uh, the most dangerous kind of monetary system, I believe, is a, uh, a gold standard with substantial fiduciary media. Uh, see, suppose you have uh, a gold standard where the quantity of actual gold in the system uh, is no longer the bulk of the money supply, it's a small fraction, but the whole of the money supply is payable in gold uh, on demand. Uh, whatever is not gold is a transferable claim to gold uh, payable on demand, but uh, there is no actual gold. Well, uh, such a money supply uh, can be uh, simply wiped out uh, if it's been allowed to first expand. It can be wiped out uh, toward uh, the gold base. And exactly this is what was happening uh, in the early 30s. And uh, nominal GDP, which I pointed out was about 104 billion in 1929, uh, in 1933, it was down to 55 billion. So that's uh, more than a 45% reduction in overall spending. Uh, notice, uh, not only did the quantity of money fall on the order of more than 25%, but uh, what was implied about velocity? The velocity fell substantially as well uh, from something uh, uh, roughly about four in 1929 uh, to, uh, uh, I think, roughly on the order of 3 or 2.9 in 1933. Now, why would you expect velocity to fall also? Because people are afraid to spend. Uh, they have liabilities that they're uh, obliged to meet. And uh, if banks are failing and firms are failing left and right, uh, how secure are their assets? What do you have to have possess if you want to be sure uh, to pay your bills on time? Yeah. You have to have cash. So the demand for money for holding uh, shoots up, and that uh, brings velocity down. Yes, Ms. Nikolova. Um, why does the Swiss banks are the most desirable banks to put your money in? Swiss? Yeah. Why does the Swiss banks are the most desirable? Is it only because they're not exposed to war and the war history of the country, or is it because of um, the velocity of the GDP? Well, of the I, I suppose uh, their neutrality and uh, comparative security from war is, is a factor, uh, but also importantly would be uh, bank secrecy. Uh, you can have an account in Switzerland and uh, they won't reveal it, but that's getting less secure 
uh, the United States government, I think, uh, has uh, twisted the arm of the Swiss somewhat, uh, so uh, one can't absolutely count on it. I think if they can claim uh, your money is from drugs or something, uh, maybe the Swiss will reveal it. And if they'll reveal drug money, then <coughs> it's not long before they reveal tax evasion money. So uh, I wouldn't uh, bank on the, the safety of the Swiss banks. Now, uh, what I want to briefly go into, uh, without spending too much time on fiduciary media, is just uh, how they come into existence, how fiduciary media are created. Yes? I just had a quick question. Um, now, did you say bank, bank premises was like the actual tangible building? Yeah, the building, the okay. Xerox machines. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the capital surplus, how did you define that again? Well, the capital and surplus would be the excess of the assets over the liabilities. Okay. The, the excess of assets over liabilities. Okay. <laughs> and that's considered a liability. The capital and surplus is shown on the liability side. That's what makes the asset and liability side balance. Balance, okay. Okay. Okay, now, uh, this is uh, figure 12.1 uh, from chapter uh, 12, and it's an attempt to explain how fiduciary media come into existence. And we have here a set of T accounts. Uh, these things are a kind of elongated T. Uh, we have uh, the public uh, in one uh, sector and the banking system in another. And we'll imagine we have some given individual who possesses $100 in currency. And this individual wants to, it will take his $100 in currency and deposit it in a bank. So this individual is going to be uh, minus a currency in the amount of $100 and plus a checking deposit in that amount. This is item one. And if we look at that same transaction from the perspective of a bank or the banking system, uh, the bank has uh, an additional asset, it's plus currency in the amount of $100, and also plus a checking deposit liability in the amount of $100. So, uh, so far, uh, no problem. If it stopped here, uh, the individual can now write checks uh, up to $100 instead of spending the currency of $100. Uh, there'd be no creation of money of any kind. Uh, under this arrangement, the uh, up to this point, the bank would be on 100% reserve. It would have uh, claims uh, to standard money, claims to currency, and it would have that amount of currency backing the claim. The, the, the depositor has a claim to $100, and the bank has $100. So far, it's 100% uh, reserve. Uh, where we start to get fiduciary media is if, and to the extent, that the bank lends out uh, any part of the currency deposited. And uh, let's, uh, and that will be item two. Uh, the bank is going to lend $80. The bank is going to lend out currency, we'll assume. Uh, so it's minus currency in the amount of $80. And it receives from the borrower an IOU. And this is plus IOUs from public, $80, item two. So here we are, uh, you go into a bank, uh, you're going to borrow $80, you give them your IOU for 80, they'll give you currency of 80. The bank's uh, total asset value is unchanged, and now we look at you uh, as a member of the public, uh, you're plus currency in the amount of 80, and you're, uh, you have a liability, uh, you're plus an IOU to the bank uh, for 80. Well, uh, what is the amount of spendable money now? Pardon me? The borrower or the bank? Well, what's the total amount of spendable money in the hands of the public? 180. 180. Okay, I hear 180 for most people. I hear 100 from one or maybe two. Uh, anyone still think it's 100? It's actually 180. Why is it now 180 of spendable money? The loan of 80 plus the claim to 100. Yeah, there's a, a transferable claim to 100, that's spendable money, right? And now circulating alongside of it is the 80 of currency. There's a 80 of currency, and then there's a, a claim to 100, which is uh, spendable money. So there's 180 of spendable money, where there used to be just 100. Now, uh, here I've assumed that uh, the bank has lent currency. 
Uh, that is not by any means the usual way they lend money. If you go and borrow money from a bank, uh, they'll uh, take your IOU, uh, let's say you're borrowing $80 again, so uh, they're going to be plus uh, your IOU for $80. But instead of lending you $80 in currency, what they would do is create a checking deposit for you. They would say, okay, uh, here's your $80, it's in your brand new checking account, uh, go ahead and write checks. Okay, well the bank has $100 in currency, and what's happened uh, to uh, the checking deposits uh, that the customers now have, and which represents spendable money. They have that initial deposit uh, of $100, and they have uh, that secondary deposit of $80, which the bank has just granted. So again, there's $180 of spendable money. Uh, the banks have created $80 of uh, spendable money. Now, imagine this process being repeated again and again and again. You see here, we have uh, still, uh, the bank has 100 against 180. That's a, uh, that would be a high reserve. Uh, you'd have to imagine uh, the banks uh, creating more and more such deposits uh, and getting more and more IOUs and securities and so forth until we would get to the point that uh, they have $100 of actual money in their possession and maybe uh, $5,000 of uh, deposits. That would be approximately where we are today. The overwhelming uh, bulk of the uh, money supply is uh, transferable claims uh, to standard money for which the standard money doesn't actually exist. And uh, this represents uh, what has been called fiduciary media. And uh, fiduciary media uh, represent a deflationary potential. This is a uh, part of the money supply that conceivably could be wiped out. Mm. Now this is not to say that it actually will be wiped out or that it's very likely that it will be wiped out, but uh, it, it has the ability to be wiped out. And uh, that prospect, I think, uh, scares the hell out of the uh, Federal Reserve System. And so when developments start to occur that uh, are moving in that direction, uh, what do you think the Federal Reserve uh, immediately does? Pardon me? Increases the reserve. Requires more reserve. Well, if it required more reserves, that would have the opposite effect. Because uh, if it would mean if, if you suddenly had to have a bigger percentage of reserves, how would you get a bigger percentage of reserves in the absence of more reserves? You have to start calling loans, wiping out deposits. That's the opposite of what they would like. Uh, see, in the past, when uh, banks would feel threatened that they didn't have uh, sufficient reserves. Uh, they'd slam on uh, on the brakes uh, against new loans. Uh, they'd want outstanding loans to be paid off as they matured. And what do you think that would do to the business firms that had to repay? Imagine you owe money to a bank, and up to now you've been getting it renewed when it comes due, or you refinance through a different bank. And now uh, they're telling you, uh, Joe, uh, you owe us $50,000. Uh, we want it repaid, and we're not renewing it. Cash flow I mean, you've got a serious uh, cash flow problem, so you might have to uh, have a, a liquidation sale. Uh, you have to raise cash somehow, uh, liquidate your inventory, uh, look for a buyer uh, to buy some assets of yours, uh, and this would be uh, the makings of a major uh, financial contraction. And this sort of thing happened uh, every few years uh, in our history uh, from the late 18th century down to uh, 1933. Because what we would have is the whole boom-bust cycle. The boom phase would be the phase in which the banks are creating new and additional fiduciary media. They're enlarging the quantity of money and they're putting it into the system through the loan market. And so long as the quantity of money is growing, uh, the volume of spending is growing, uh, profits are picking up, everything looks happy and rosy. But under a gold standard, there is a limit to how far that process can be carried. And uh, as the amount of outstanding fiduciary media uh, gets to be too large, well, uh, then things start to happen. Uh, one of the things observed 
uh, by the middle of the 19th century uh, was the problem of the external drain, which relates to the balance of payments issue. Uh, suppose here we are in Great Britain, uh, the banking system of Britain is uh, creating new and additional money, new and additional fiduciary media, uh, which it's lending out, and uh, business in Britain is picking up, everything looks good. Uh, well, as uh, business activity in Britain starts going up, what do you think will happen uh, to uh, Britain's demand for imports? Go up. Go up. That will go up. And uh, to what extent do you think people over the rest of the world are all that eager uh, to hold uh, British uh, paper notes or checking deposits in London? Uh, uh, they will not be ready to do that. Uh, Britain will have... Uh, uh, more expenditures uh, to abroad uh, without corresponding additional revenues. So it'll have a negative balance of payments and how will that balance of payments be settled? Uh, if uh, banks in Britain uh, owe money to uh, banks in Argentina and France and the United States, whatever, uh, how will they be settling the balances they owe? They'll, they'll be losing gold. They'll be losing gold to be uh, a drain of gold. And so that reduces their gold reserves. Now, they can stand a limited reduction in reserves if they didn't have a razor-thin margin to start with, but they can't let, let this go on very long. So what do they have to do to put an end to the loss of reserves? Well, they have to stop the credit expansion, uh, start uh, not renewing some loans, and this would precipitate the crisis. Uh, so uh, that was recognized, but uh, the process was repeated uh, nevertheless uh, over and over again. And uh, uh, things occurred uh, uh, certainly in connection uh, uh, with the establishment of our Federal Reserve System and uh, World War I uh, that allowed the process uh, to go further than it had before, uh, that contributed uh, to a greater uh, than normal expansion of fiduciary media. Uh, setting the stage for a much bigger than normal contraction. And that bigger than normal contraction was the uh, Great Depression of 1929. Now, uh, a way that had been proposed uh, in the 19th century and that uh, had actually been enacted into law in Great Britain, uh, there was a major piece of legislation uh, known as P uh, the Peel Act of 1844, uh, it was fairly well understood what the problem was, uh, this expansion of fiduciary media, and legislation was introduced to try to stop it. And uh, they required uh, that the banks have 100% uh, uh, reserve against the, uh, the issue of additional bank notes. Uh, the banks in those days uh, were issuing their own uh, paper currencies, and it was required by law that they have uh, gold pound for pound against all new and additional banknotes. It wasn't understood at that time that checking deposits are as much money as the, uh, as the banknotes, so they failed to cover uh, the checking deposits. But uh, the basic idea was grasped that uh, what would stop the boom-bust cycle was if you avoided the issue of fiduciary media to begin with. If you didn't uh, create unbacked claims to standard money, uh, if you didn't create such claims, uh, you wouldn't have the boom phase and you wouldn't then have the potential for the uh, deflation depression. And uh, my own belief is that uh, if we had had uh, that kind of uh, monetary system, that would be a gold standard, but not the kind of gold standard we actually possessed, uh, a, a special gold standard known as a 100% reserve gold standard where all of the money is uh, backed by gold. Not 25%, uh, not 10%, not 40%, but uh, gold, uh, ounce for ounce, dollar for dollar. Now, uh, with that kind of gold standard, uh, you cannot have inflation because you can't manufacture gold ad libitum. Uh, it increases very modestly, so there's no problem of inflation. But uh, there is also no problem of deflation. There's no way that a gold money, once it comes into existence, is suddenly going to get wiped out of existence. That problem exists when you have a fractional reserve gold standard with fiduciary media. 
uh, that would be a gold standard that would be inflation proof and also deflation depression proof. The kind that we had was uh, unfortunately <coughs> very different. Yes, uh, Mr. Boisseau. Uh, we may have already covered this, but do, do any countries that you know of operate on a 100% gold standard right now? No, not even on a fractional gold reserve standard. Not even? No, not no, any. not any, no. Yes, uh, Mr. Taylor. So you mentioned a moment ago that um, one way to avoid the boom bust is not to operate on this fiduciary media. Yeah, if we didn't have fiduciary media, uh, we, if we avoided the boom phase, uh, we would avoid the bust phase. But in, re in reality, that's not really possible, is it? In terms of, if in fact our whole, what I'm looking at is the whole banking industry. I mean, the, the banking industry needs to have deposits come in, and if it was restricted to just lend out based upon, if it was restricted to the standard you just described, then they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be able to be in business. Oh no, you could still have banking, uh, but you see, what the banks would lend would not be the proceeds of checking deposits, they'd lend the proceeds of savings deposits. So there's a big difference when someone uh, makes a savings deposit, he's parting with the ability to spend that money until it's withdrawn. So the bank can lend that money, and it's not adding to the money supply, it's transferring money from the depositor to the borrower. But when you put money into a checking account, you still have the right to make right checks, uh, you, that money is still spendable, and then the money that's lent is also spendable. And as money market accounts, you, would, you consider that to be a check? Uh, I think that the, the, today's money market accounts are uh, largely uh, checking accounts. Now, uh, the, the principle of the 100% reserve applies just to checking accounts mm -hmm. and to the issue of bank notes. Uh, it doesn't apply to savings deposits. Yes, Mr. Foster? Uh, I'm sorry, were you suggesting that that would be a good idea? Because as you're speaking, I just think that's a great target for terrorists. Acts, Which? Just to blow up all your gold, and then I would ruin your whole economy. <laughs> okay, uh, now you see, it's a possible target today whether there's only two holdings of gold, essentially. Uh, there's Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And they conceivably could be targets. Uh, you know, there was a, a James Bond story many years ago, Dr. No, and I think uh, his plan was to uh, drop an A-bomb or something on, on the gold reserve, uh, make it irradiated, uh, uh, so his gold holding would rise in value. Uh, Goldfinger, I'm sorry, not Dr. No. I said Dr. No, Goldfinger, forgive me. Okay, uh, that might be a risk in today's system, but if we had a 100% uh, gold reserve system with gold as the actual money, uh, where would the gold be found in the country? It wouldn't be in the vaults of the Federal Reserve System or at Fort Knox. It would be uh, in our uh, personal possession, in the possession of millions of citizens and business firms. So uh, it would be much less of a, of a terrorist target. Yes, Mr. Sweeney. This uh, question, if you did do that 100% gold standard, then wouldn't you restrict the economic growth to just the level that you could produce the gold? Okay, if we uh, did this, if we limited the increase in money to the increase in gold, and that would be modest, let's say the quantity of money would grow perhaps 2% a year, thereabouts, uh, that would limit the growth in nominal GDP. Uh, GDP uh, might grow uh, only 2% a year. But that doesn't mean that production would be limited to 2% a year. Uh, what would happen if, while spending is going up 2% a year, production were going up 4% a year? Is it possible for 2% more spending to buy 4% more goods and services? Yes. That's what would price. be necessary? Price. If prices fell, fell up by the difference. Yeah. So it's not a limitation on physical growth. What it would mean is, instead of every year having uh, some significant rise in prices, uh, we would have uh, more widely uh, uh, spread falling prices. Uh, to some degree, uh, what we experience in the computer industry, where things get uh, cheaper every year, uh, that would be a much more common experience. Uh, you might be buying a new automobile uh, for a little bit less than you bought last year's model. Or uh, uh, you spend a little less uh, for this year's clothing than last year's clothing, perhaps. Um, or you could buy uh, better uh, clothing. And, and whatever. Now, let me point out that uh, we had a whole century that worked this way. 
that was the 19th century. I, th I may have already said uh, that at the end of the 19th century, uh, prices uh, were estimated to be a half of what they had been at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, that's because uh, even though we had substantial growth in money and spending, uh, it wasn't <coughs> as rapid as the increase in production and supply. And just think, what would that would mean uh, to people looking forward to retirement, for example? It'd be great. It would mean they wouldn't have to worry about uh, their savings being wiped out. Uh, they could count on having uh, somewhat greater buying power uh, with any given sum of money from one year to the next. Uh, in today's arrangement, uh, if you uh, retire, and you have any kind of fixed income arrangement, uh, you're entirely at the mercy of, of the current government policies. If the government thinks, well, uh, they need to boost the economy uh, by running off a lot more money, well, here you are. Uh, you're going to end up uh, being faced with substantially higher prices. And uh, the buying power of your life savings will be substantially reduced. Would that be like the cigarette smoker? quit smoking because you figure that cigarettes worth more and more. Well, not the, 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 the oh, you mean uh, the, the holding of, of if we had gold, not the present system. Right. Uh, would uh, people want to hold more money uh, under a, a gold standard uh, than they do now? Uh, they would want to hold somewhat more money. Uh, the velocity of money uh, would be lower than it is today. Uh, the next major point I'll try to show is that uh, a major determinant of velocity is the rate at which the quantity of money increases. The more rapidly the quantity of money increases, the less desirable is it to own such a money. And therefore, it'll be spent more rapidly. Uh, the more slowly the quantity of money increases, the more desirable it is to own such a money, and it'll be spent less rapidly. The velocity will be lower. Now, uh, and you can see this, I think, if you look at different currencies around the world. Uh, where would you expect there to be a greater uh, demand for money for holding? Uh, in the United States or uh, Argentina or Mexico? US. US. I think in the US. Do you think there are many Argentines or Mexicans who are stashing away pesos in safety deposit boxes? No, because they know that in a year, even in a year, uh, there's likely to be a substantial loss in purchasing power. Now, you might uh, stash away dollars, but even then, uh, you have to look forward uh, to a loss. Uh, it would be more desirable uh, to stash away gold, uh, less likely to have a loss. So uh, that's a factor, obviously, uh, reducing velocity. But I have uh, uh, several different uh, uh, ways of developing this point that I want to go into. And uh, this is all under the heading, the quantity of money and the demand for money. Uh, and my first point here is uh, velocity uh, is a reflection of the demand for money for holding. It's an inverse reflection. Uh, the less people desire to hold the money, the higher velocity. Uh, the more they want to hold the money, the lower is velocity. And what I want to develop here uh, are these points under three, uh, changes in the quantity of money as the cause of changes in the demand for money and thus the velocity of money. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. White. Very quick question. Is there some kind of, um, you know, we talked about the possession of gold and mm -hmm. how it was at one time illegal to use it for the buying and trading of things. Um, is there some kind of law about the, the, the actual physical exporting of, like, currency? Like, can I just, like, get on an airplane with currency that you know, I got from wherever it came from and just get on an airplane and try and go somewhere with it. I don't know if there's a problem of taking uh, currency out in any way. Uh, you know, supposedly it's legal uh, to take currency out or in, in any quantity, but there are reporting requirements, and I'm not sure if they apply only to bringing currency in. I know they apply to bringing currency in. I'm not sure if they apply to taking currency out. <coughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Uh, the cutoff amount, at least for bringing currency in, is $10,000. And if you bring in US currency, US currency uh, if you bring in uh, 10000 or more without reporting it, without filling out some special form, uh, it can simply be seized from you. Wow. And, uh, and that's it. <coughs> so um, that's uh, pretty high-handed. 
Now, as I say, I'm not sure about taking the currency out. If you are planning to take more than $10,000 out, or even $10,000, uh, I think you'd be well advised to be exactly sure what uh, legal requirements there might be. Okay. Yes, when you uh, leave the country, you don't go through customs. It's right. Going into the right. country, going right. into, I think that would be more of the issue. Yeah, that's where they could catch you, yeah. and so that's why I say I know when you bring it in, uh, and perhaps since there is no uh, exit requirement, but even today, you know, to get access uh, to an airliner, you have to go through a security check, and uh, I think the uh, currency issued in the last several years. Uh, uh, may be uh, sensitive uh, and can be picked up. Th that's why they have it. They want to know, uh, they want to be able to identify uh, currency. Mm. It's one of the reasons. Uh, I shouldn't quite say that, perhaps. Uh, they say they want to distinguish it from counterfeit money. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it is possible that uh, it could be detected. Right. Okay, now, why should it be the case that uh, the more rapidly the quantity of money increases, uh, the less will be the desire to hold it uh, and the greater the velocity. Uh, I think there's a, a variety of reasons uh, beyond the obvious one we named of uh, what money is uh, suitable uh, for long-term holding. Uh, this first point is uh, the effect of credit expansion on the prospects for borrowing. Now, a major part of the new and additional money enters the economic system in the form of loans. Uh, the banks are creating uh, new and additional money when they enlarge their deposits. And uh, when they do that, uh, they're lending it out. They're creating loans. Uh, what's the effect of that, other things being equal, on interest rates? Lowers it. it lowers it. Now, uh, to the extent that uh, people develop uh, any kind of anticipation, that uh, they can readily and profitably borrow money from their banks if they should need it, particularly businessmen. Uh, to the extent that businessmen uh, develop the belief that as they need money for their operations, they can readily and profitably borrow it from the banks, because the banks are there uh, generating more of it, uh, how will that affect their perception of the extent to which they need to hold money? Yes. It'll be less. Why hold money if uh, the money you might need, you can readily borrow? Uh, use that money that you would have had to hold uh, had you not been able to borrow easily and profitably, uh, invest that money. So now, to the extent that uh, people <coughs> reduce their cash holdings, uh, that money is spent. Uh, and if the recipients have the same kind of attitude uh, when they get it, uh, they'll uh, be operating to respend it that much more rapidly. So uh, when credit expansion is going on and, and people have gotten a little bit used to it, uh, that is a factor serving to reduce the demand for money for holding and thus uh, raising velocity. Now a further element, uh, if the quantity of money and volume of spending are growing, uh, what is the effect of that on the ability uh, easily and profitably to liquidate inventories? Pardon me? It's going to be easier. It'll make it easier. So uh, uh, if you are contemplating how much inventory you should hold, if uh, in one circumstance you don't think the demand for your product is going to be rising very rapidly, maybe it won't even be rising at all, uh, in those circumstances uh, you're going to hold one level of inventory. Uh, if you think uh, the level of demand is rising and you can uh, find more buyers uh, for your inventory at, at profitable prices, well, then I think you'd be inclined to put more money into inventory rather than holding it. So uh, that's uh, the ability to substitute other assets uh, for cash holdings. Uh, now, related to that, uh, well, closely related, the anticipation of higher prices. Uh, if you believe that, uh, if, if there's something you're interested in buying, but uh, ordinarily, you'd not be ready to buy it right away. You might decide, uh, I'd like to buy this, but uh, I'll wait to buy my new car next year. Uh, suppose you thought that next year, uh, the price of a new car uh, would be substantially higher than the price of a new car today. Uh, then you'd be inclined to buy it now. So uh, people would be uh, uh, induced to buy sooner rather than later. 
uh, that uh, serves to uh, raise velocity. And then finally, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, there's another uh, connection, point D, uh, the effect of more money on the rate of interest. And this is a little bit tricky uh, because I'm saying here uh, the effect of more money on the rate of interest, which after a temporary drop, namely the rate of interest temporarily drops, uh, the longer term effect is to raise uh, the rate of profit and thus uh, to increase the demand for and reduce the supply of loanable funds, which means raise the rate of interest. Uh, we normally assume that uh, expanding the quantity of money, uh, especially when it's coming into the economy in the loan market, we normally think that that lowers the rate of interest. And it does, but only temporarily. And uh, you can see this perhaps uh, going on even today. Uh, why has the Federal Reserve uh, decided to step back? Uh, I shouldn't say step back. Why have they decided uh, uh, to nudge interest rates up somewhat? And we'll probably do so another half point over the next several months. Why not just keep, try to keep interest rates, uh, the, the federal funds rate, down at 1%? Because I don't want to re elect Bush. Slow the expansion. I suppose they did. I suppose uh, they decided. Well, we'll just keep uh, creating as many, as much new and additional reserves as is required uh, to keep the federal funds rate at one percent. Uh, the banks uh, have uh, additional reserves. They'll create additional deposits. Uh, if that takes hold and uh, starts increasing the volume of spending, which is the purpose of the policy. Uh, as the volume of spending goes up, what happens to sales revenues and profit margins? They go up, they go up right? And that's one of the things uh, that's being sought. And as profit margins rise, what happens to the rate of profit on the capital invested? That would go up too, right? Well, now, if the rate of profit that business firms uh, across the economy, if the rate of profit that they can earn is now higher, uh, how does that affect their willingness and ability uh, to pay uh, a higher rate of interest? They can afford a higher rate of interest. It's worth paying. See, uh, the main determinant of the rate of interest, uh, I believe, is the rate of profit. Uh, the rate of profit. Uh, the rate of return that you can make uh, after you've borrowed the money and have invested it. That will determine uh, how high a rate of interest it's worthwhile to pay. If the rate of profit on capital was only 4%, uh, that would uh, serve to limit the rate of interest uh, to something below 4%. If the rate of profit on capital is 6%, uh, the rate of interest uh, can be closer to 6%. Well, just think, uh, the more rapidly uh, the quantity of money and volume of spending grow, uh, the necessary effect is to widen profit margins and the rate of profit. And that means uh, uh, see, every business firm, or almost every business firm, has the uh, choice uh, to use the funds in its possession. It could use them to expand its own operations, or it might lend some of them in the loan market. Now, what's going to determine the extent to which a firm uh, will use the funds available to it uh, for its own operations or to lend them out or seek to borrow funds? Interest rate. It's the relationship between the rate of profit they think they can make and the rate of interest they can earn or pay. So now, if the rate of profit starts to go up, uh, how will that affect the decisions of firms as to how much money uh, to lend out uh, in the banking system or to other firms uh, compared with how much to retain uh, for their own internal use. If the rate of profit you can earn by using the funds yourself is going up, you're not going to make it as, as available uh, to others unless you get a higher rate of interest. You'll need a higher rate of interest to go on uh, supplying funds. Now, if you have a higher rate of profit, what does that do to your readiness to borrow money at a given rate of interest? You'll be more prepared to borrow. So as the rate of profit goes up, the demand for loanable funds will rise at any given rate of interest, and the supply of loanable funds will fall. 
the supply of loanable funds coming from business firms. From business firms? From business firms. Right. Not from the banks, but from business firms. Ordinary business firms. See, we have to realize uh, business firms are themselves a major supplier of loanable funds. When business firms buy things like CDs, uh, they're making funds available uh, to the banking system to lend. Now, if business firms can earn a higher rate of profit on the uh, funds, uh, they won't be ready to buy CDs unless they can get a, a higher rate of interest. And they'll be ready to borrow more if they can earn a higher rate of profit. So as uh, the quantity of money and volume of spending increase and rates of profit rise, uh, it's virtually inevitable that interest rates will have to rise. Uh, if they didn't, uh, if the uh, Federal Reserve uh, wanted to pursue a policy of holding interest rates down uh, in the face of a rising volume of spending and sales revenues and profits, uh, what would they have to do to how much additional money they created? Uh, what would they have to do uh, to their rate of increase in the quantity of money? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Wright, I think, is uh, uh, seeing the, where this would end. The rate of increase in the quantity of money would have to grow uh, exponentially. See, uh, suppose we start out, we have a low rate of profit. Uh, say the rate of profit is 4%. And the rate of interest is pretty low, too. Imagine it's 3%. And uh, the Federal Reserve wants to reduce interest rates. They want to make it possible for business firms to borrow at 2.5% rather than 3%. Now, they may achieve this uh, by uh, creating more bank reserves, encouraging the banks uh, to make additional loans, expand the quantity of money further. And suppose they succeed in uh, stimulating business. And now the volume of spending is growing will the rate of profit remain at the initial 4%? No. No, it's going to go higher. For the sake of illustration, let's assume it's elevated to 6%. Now, uh, when the rate of profit was 4%, uh, uh, the uh, rate of interest that the market would generate was, would be 3%, the Fed knocked it down to 25 And they did that by bringing about some creation of new and additional money to appear in the loan market as an additional <coughs> supply of loanable funds. But if the uh, rate of profit is now 6%, how much additional money would need to be created to uh, bring interest rates not from 3% to 2.5%, but maybe from 4.5% to 2.5%? See, because if the rate of profit were established at 6%, what kind of interest rate would that serve to generate? Do you think interest rates would be likely to stay even at 3%? They'd be tending higher than they were to begin with, and what do you have to do to lean against a developing market rate of 4.5% and to hold that to 2.5% rather than a market rate of 3% to 2.5%? That requires more expansion. And let's say they had enough expansion to do that. Uh, they have to create a lot more money to do that. What will be the effect of that on the volume of spending, sales revenues, and the rate of profit? Now maybe it's 10%. And if you're going to hold the rate of interest to 2.5% in the face of a 10% rate of profit, uh, you'd have to be creating money hand over fist. So uh, what happens in order uh, to avoid uh, plunging the economy into hyperinflation, they really have no alternative but to allow interest rates to trail the rate of profit on up. And that's what they've already started to do in this small way uh, raising the federal funds rate from 1% uh, to 1.5%, and uh, supposedly it'll go to 2% in the near future. Because they're afraid of the pickup in business in uh, requiring more monetary expansion if their intention is uh, to keep the rate of interest so low. And you can see this, uh, this is what developed over uh, several decades. Uh, we had very low interest rates in the 1950s, they weren't low enough for many people, uh, so they got the Fed on an expansionary course, and uh, they, they kept at this, and uh, profit rates and interest rates rose <coughs> uh, over the uh, 50s uh, up through uh, the early 80s. And then uh, they reversed course, uh, they uh, raised interest rates very dramatically in 1980, 
Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve discount rate went briefly to 22 percent uh, with a penalty rate. Uh, the federal funds rate was in that neighborhood. Uh, they very sharply uh, cut back the rate of increase in the quantity of money. The initial effect was it suddenly appeared there's vastly less money available for lending. But it also meant there was less money available to boost sales revenues and nominal profits <coughs> and to raise prices. Uh, the uh, profit margins and the rate of profit fell. And then what do you think started to happen to the rate of interest? It started coming down. So uh, over the longer term, uh, the effect of uh, an easy money policy uh, credit expansion is to raise interest rates. Yes, Mr. Uh, yeah, I'm Taylor. Sorry, I have to ask this. I'm having a hard time understanding why um, you keep going with higher revenue when you're looking at higher profits. Why that practically uh, and tactically leads to inflation? Because what's fueling the higher revenues and the higher profits is the expansion in the quantity of money. That essentially is the inflation. And as soon as the increase in money and spending outstrips the increase in production and supply, prices are rising. And if you're going to have new and additional money uh, to the extent of keeping interest rates at 2.5%, while the rate of profit is already 8 or 10%, well, you'd have to have stupendous increases in money uh, offered on the loan market to keep interest rates down. But uh, I'd very much like to uh, go ahead into uh, this last point here, that uh, if we can agree that interest rates will tend to go up, the, uh, the very effect of higher interest rates is further uh, to uh, raise velocity, to reduce the demand for money for holding. And the way this can be understood is uh, for many, many businesses, uh, in order to make it worthwhile uh, to engage in, in a loan transaction, uh, there has to be some minimum amount of interest to be earned. It doesn't pay uh, to put something on the books if it'll only bring in $5 or something. So, uh, let us assume that in order uh, for a loan transaction to be worthwhile, at least for many businesses, it has to earn a minimum amount of interest of, say, $100 before it's worth doing. Now, if the annual rate of interest is very low, say 2%, uh, what is the shortest period of time, uh, or what would be the minimum size sum, I should say, what would be the smallest sum that would be worthwhile to lend for a period as short as one week at an annual interest rate of 2%, and the requirement that the uh, loan yield you at least $100. What sum is required at a 2% annual interest rate to generate $100 of interest in one week? $250,000. It pays to lend $250,000 or more for a period as short as one week at an interest rate as low as 2%. That will bring in $100 or more. Uh, would it pay uh, to lend out uh, uh, $100,000 uh, available just for a week under these assumptions? That would only bring in $40. Now, at any given time, there are various firms that have uh, available sums of money uh, for, that they could part with for a period as short as a week. But if those sums are less than 250000 then on these assumptions, it doesn't pay them to lend the sums. Uh, they're better off just holding them. But what if uh, interest rates uh, end up not staying at 2%, they go to 4%. What is the minimum size sum uh, needed to earn $100 in one week at a 4% annual interest rate? 125000 Now what does that imply about the worthwhileness of lending sums available uh, just for a period of one week, but less than 250000 it's now sufficient if they're merely greater than 125000 So all those sums in the hands of various firms that are now greater than 125 and less than 250, they were not worth lending at a 2% annual interest rate, but they are worth lending at a 4% annual interest rate. Well, what effect do you think that has on the volume of lending and spending? It would increase. And so what's the effect on the velocity of circulation? 
they would increase. So as interest rates go up, uh, there is a tendency uh, for short-term funds, smaller size short-term funds, uh, funds available for shorter periods uh, to be drawn into the spending stream. That is uh, a further element, raising velocity. So the, the more rapid increase in money and spending in these four different ways uh, serves to uh, raise velocity. Now, Mr. Chun. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that back in the uh, 1980s, the early 1980s, uh, the federal fund or whatever was at 22 percent yeah. or something. Yeah, the, the discount rate. The I, discount maybe rate. I need to explain oh, that. Oh. I need to explain that. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, how do you explain that? Or is there a relationship that you see that uh, why would the uh, the stock market crash fail in 1989? Why did the stock market uh, take a big dive? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, it was 89 or 87. There was one, 87. 87. There was one day, uh, the Dow Jones average opened, or it was the day before, was at 2,500, and then it lost 500 points in one day. Uh, I think that the uh, most reasonable explanation was uh, there had been new and additional money uh, coming into the stock market that was driving it up to 2,500. And then the Federal Reserve cut back on the expansion, and that pulled the uh, the rug out. It's the same story uh, of the bursting of the bubble in uh, 2000. Uh, we had this uh, stock market bubble that was being fueled uh, by uh, the creation of new and additional money, uh, much of which was going into the stock market. I think the way it worked was, imagine that you have a firm which wants to uh, buy another firm. Uh, and perhaps they want to buy the stock of the other firm. If the financing to do that came from the creation of new and additional money, imagine uh, they get a bank loan uh, sufficient to buy uh, the shares that they want. Now, uh, stockholders in the target firm are getting an offer of cash for their shares, and we assume they accept it. Uh, what will they do with practically all of the cash they receive? They'll turn around and they'll buy other stocks. And what will the sellers of those other stocks do? Uh, they'll do it. So we have new and additional money, that uh, most of which is racing around the stock market, uh, kicking up share prices as it goes. And uh, this process was continued for a while. Uh, some of this new and additional money uh, starts moving out of the stock market. Uh, people feel richer. Uh, so uh, some people will want to cash in part of their gains, uh, buy the home they've been uh, planning to buy, uh, buy new automobiles, uh, so uh, money starts uh, draining, but uh, that can be offset for quite a while by fresh infusions. In fact, the fresh infusions can outweigh the withdrawals, and so you can have uh, further increases. But what happens uh, once uh, these increases, uh, these further infusions of funds stop? Is there now anything left uh, to keep driving the market up? But meanwhile, for various reasons, uh, funds are leaving. Uh, people are uh, cashing in on their gains. Uh, there may be companies that want to engage in physical expansion. Uh, see, uh, just think, uh, a, a major asset of so many firms and, and individuals is the market value of, of their stocks. And uh, the higher the value, uh, the larger the number of projects, the bigger the projects uh, you feel you can undertake. And so, uh, to the extent that firms are uh, cashing in securities uh, to get the money to build factories, let's say, uh, that's taking money uh, out of the stock market uh, into uh, the regular physical economy. And if the infusions are not continuing, uh, what, what is the, there to support the stock market? Uh, you're, you're pulling the foundation out, plus, uh, after the rise has been going on for a while, there's a lot of people who think the rise is just going to continue. They jump in. Uh, that fuels the rise further. But when you pull out the foundation for continuing increases, uh, that crowd has to get out. And uh, the money is draining away in the absence of further infusions. And so uh, that's the basis for the collapse. But would you think that the collapse uh, in 1987 versus in 2000 is different because in 2000 it collapsed because one sector, the high tech industry, uh, had an overstocking inventory and because of changing regulation in, you know, in foreign country and so forth, that now they, they have the, un the, the unbalance, <coughs> imbalance. 
Well, um, there, are, there are always, every, uh, every such uh, episode has its own unique peculiarities, but I think uh, the basic element both times was uh, the infusion of new and additional money, boosting the market, and then uh, ending that process that uh, pulled the plug on the, on the, on the arrangement. All right, uh, I feel obligated uh, to say something as much as possible now about uh, the uh, balance of payments doctrine, uh, which uh, can be connected uh, with the concept of the demand for money. First off, uh, the meaning of the balance of payments and the balance of trade, uh, these are related matters. Uh, the balance of trade is essentially the difference between imports and exports. Uh, we have uh, exports, uh, what we sell our goods abroad for, uh, imports, uh, what we're paying to, to bring goods in. And uh, the balance of payments is a wider concept uh, which incorporates all sources of receipts from abroad, not just exports, but everything. Uh, uh, borrowings from abroad, uh, foreign investments, uh, all outlays to abroad, not just imports, uh, tourist expenditures, uh, our lending abroad, our uh, military aid abroad. Uh, the balance of payments includes uh, every category of receipt from abroad, every category of expenditure to abroad. Uh, remittances to relatives in foreign countries, gifts, uh, loans, uh, stock purchases, everything. Now, uh, historically, for a very long time, these two concepts uh, coincided in practice. Uh, until the 19th century, uh, there was no international capital market. Uh, the international capital market was largely destroyed uh, for much of the 20th century. And so, uh, international economic relations uh, for uh, most of modern economic history were more or less confined to uh, imports and exports. Uh, no extensive uh, lending and borrowing <coughs> for major periods. And when that was true, and it was true pretty much uh, until sometime in the 19th century, uh, the balance of trade and the balance of payments uh, pretty much coincided. Uh, the only significant items were imports and exports. These concepts uh, originated uh, perhaps back in the 17th century, maybe even the 16th century. Uh, I refer in point two to historical origins of the concepts, uh, mercantilism. Uh, already by the 16th century, certainly, uh, there were uh, hardly any producing gold or silver mines in Europe. Uh, the gold and silver mines in Europe had been uh, pretty much exhausted. And of course, gold and silver was the money of the time. Now, if the money supply of a country were to increase, if the gold money supply of a country were to increase uh, in those conditions, uh, what would be the only possible source of a country uh, gaining gold? Trade. Through trade. Uh, it exports its goods in exchange for gold. Uh, when it imports, it pays in gold. And uh, the uh, excess of exports over imports was considered uh, the means of obtaining an additional supply of gold. That was the only way at that time. And uh, this, uh, it, the excess of exports over imports was dubbed favorable uh, on the grounds that it was the source of an increase in the supply of gold. Uh, the mercantilists, uh, the, the mercantilists were a group of uh, authors uh, writing on various aspects of money and trade and, and economic issues. And uh, they thought it was a major uh, goal of the policy of the country uh, to accumulate a greater supply of gold and silver within its borders. And part of their thinking was, uh, to the extent that a country could accumulate more gold and silver inside its territory, that would supply uh, the government with the basis of financing uh, military adventures outside the country. Uh, they'll be involved in a war outside the country. They'll need gold and silver to finance it. If there's a lot of gold and silver in the country, uh, the king can then get it in taxes. And uh, they wanted to promote economic policies uh, designed to stimulate exports 
and uh, hamper imports. Uh, so they favored uh, tariffs on imports, uh, subsidies to exports uh, on the, on the, for the purpose of uh, increasing uh, the supply of precious metals within the country. And as I say, uh, this idea of what's favorable or unfavorable uh, dates uh, from that era and reflects that, uh, that outlook. Now, uh, the mercantilist outlook uh, had some degree, at least, of plausibility uh, under a gold standard, but uh, under the conditions of a uh, fiat money, uh, it isn't even plausible uh, because, and, and I think we went into this last week, suppose we have a loss of fiat money. Suppose uh, we spend more or we send out more uh, money in a given year uh, than comes into the country. What is our loss? Isn't it something that can very easily be replaced? And uh, we have no lack of paper money. We're increasing it at, at, a, at a substantial rate. Uh, the effect of the outflow of some of it is uh, to diminish the extent of our domestic inflation. Now, uh, so I say here, no loss in an outflow of fiat currency. And further, uh, you should realize that uh, uh, most of the, of the reported deficit, uh, very, the greater part of the reported deficit is uh, of a fictional nature. It does not represent an actual outflow of currency. There is some, I think for reasons that I explained, but uh, most of the deficit uh, does not reflect an actual movement of dollars outside of the country. Uh, what it derives from is not counting a significant part of the receipts. Uh, I believe that uh, bank deposits in the United States made by foreigners for a term of less than six months are not counted along with the receipts. If they were counted, the size of the uh, reported deficit would be sharply lower. So that's uh, the fictional nature. Now, uh, uh, let me point out in connection uh, with the unfavorable balance of trade, uh, that when a country has a so-called unfavorable balance of trade, uh, the main source of that is likely to be foreign investment in the country. And I think a good example, uh, which hopefully will drive home the point, try to imagine uh, uh, the conditions of Saudi Arabia uh, before uh, its oil industry was developed. Let's say they're just at the point where teams of geologists are satisfied that they've got huge oil reserves. Uh, but uh, the oil, there, there's no oil wells, no oil uh, fields there yet. Uh, they just have the oil underground. Now, what will have to be done in order to tap these oil reserves, to actually bring them out? What, what will they need to have uh, coming in to Saudi Arabia? They need massive amounts of equipment, uh, construction materials. They need a lot of foreign workers with the skills to do this. Uh, they'll need uh, supplies of consumers' goods to support the foreign workers. Where are these things going to come from? There'll be shiploads of goods uh, arriving in Saudi Arabia. And how, do we, how must we classify these things? Are they imports? They're imports. They're imports financed by foreign investment. So uh, Saudi Arabia will have a huge volume of imports. They could not possibly have commensurate exports. What would they have to export at that time? They have some sheep and goats, maybe. Uh, now, is there anything, in fact, unfavorable about a country receiving a massive flow of investment goods uh, to build up its ability to produce? No, there's a huge excess of imports over exports, but that's the foundation of the country improving. Now, I think uh, an unfavorable balance of trade is what allows a country to import without commensurately exporting is that foreign investors are providing the funds to pay for the imports. And that's what's making it possible. And uh, that is true in principle of us today. Uh, we're not importing uh, massive amounts of capital equipment anywhere. 
but uh, the process is working in the same way. Uh, Japanese and Chinese investors are buying uh, large volumes of newly issued United States uh, Treasury securities. Now suppose they were not present uh, to buy these Treasury securities and the Treasury was still issuing them. Where would the Treasury have to get the money uh, to buy the securities? Buy it. Uh, from, um, from the American economy. Now, uh, one way would be uh, uh, investors would be buying the Treasury securities, but what would that stop them from doing that they're now able to do? They invest in private activity, uh, provide funds for mortgages, uh, provide funds for corporations. Uh, if they couldn't do that, uh, we would have less capital available in our economy. To the extent that the Japanese and Chinese are buying the Treasury securities, the American investors don't have to, and our economy is not being stripped of its capital. So it's not that they're building up our industry, but they are preventing it from being dismantled to that extent. So it's still positive. Uh, we, it's nothing really unfavorable about this alleged unfavorable uh, balance of trade. Uh, it's uh, helping us a lot. Yes, no last question. question. Yeah. Um, if, if that's the case, then that means that, that, that the American investors then could take part in that expansion of, in, like you used to Saudi Arabia, right? Because now we don't have to spend the money, but we don't have to buy those CDs because that's basically foreign money being used to support our economy. Yeah, that, that foreign money allows the American funds uh, to, to go stay. out and, and for us to be a part of that import to those foreign countries, possibly like uh, in Iraq, as a buildup of the Iraq starts? Well, that, that's something, but I think the main element is that our own economy is not stripped of capital as it otherwise would be. Uh, the capital is available uh, for use within our economy. And we have more goods. Uh, notice. Uh, let me give you this last example. Imagine Toyota sends a shipload of automobiles over here. And uh, the automobiles are sold for dollars. Now, uh, Toyota may want to use the part of the sales revenues that represents its cash flow. Uh, they may want to invest that in the United States. Uh, for, simple, for the sake of simplicity, assume they buy uh, certi long-term certificates of deposit or some kind of securities. That money stays in the United States. It finances American economic activity. Uh, the rest of the money, the rest of the dollars, uh, Toyota will probably have to sell uh, for yen because uh, they have to pay their workers in Japan and suppliers in yen. But then we have to ask, what uh, will the uh, uh, sellers of the yen do with the dollars they bought from Toyota? Well. Suppose if they want to invest the money here, uh, that money is still here. We have the same amount of money remaining in the United States, the same volume of spending. What's different is we have Toyota's shipload of automobiles. We have the same spending, but more goods. That is uh, the net gain uh, to our economy. Okay, I don't want to keep you uh, twice, so uh, let me wish you all a good week. I'll see you next week. Okay. Uh, Tonight, we'll be dealing with the subject uh, production versus consumption, uh, the macroeconomic implications of scarcity. And uh, what I'll, my main assignment to myself is to present and develop uh, two radically opposed, mutually exclusive fundamental views of the central problem of economic life and show how these different views uh, appear in a wide variety of uh, major matters. And one view uh, I call productionism. Uh, according to it, the uh, fundamental problem of economic life is how to increase the production of wealth. How can we expand the production of wealth? And productionism takes for granted uh, the existence of a limitless need and desire for wealth. Uh, no, there's no problem of people needing or desiring wealth. The problem is producing it. Uh, in sharpest contrast, the uh, doctrine of consumptionism believes that uh, there is a strictly limited need and desire for wealth, and we already can, or are about, or are soon will be able to, uh, produce more than we need or desire. And so, in the view of consumptionism, the uh, fundamental problem is 
how to expand the need or desire for wealth so that it will be made adequate to our ability to produce it. Uh, now, uh, so you won't be in suspense, I'll tell you right off uh, that I uh, hold the, the philosophy of productionism. I think it's obvious that we uh, need and desire wealth uh, without any limit. And the problem is uh, how to expand the supply of wealth, how to produce more and more of it. And uh, just as an illustration of the proposition, I think uh, I would expect practically all of you to agree that uh, if someone is aware of the existence of automobiles and doesn't own one, uh, he almost certainly like, would like to have one. If someone has an automobile, he would almost certainly like to have a newer, better automobile. If he has several of the newest, best quality automobiles, then very likely he'd want something like a yacht or a plane. If he should have a yacht and a plane, then he will become interested in the kind of yacht on which a plane can land. <laughs> so <laughs> there is always uh, something further. Now, uh, I think there is uh, an underlying philosophical basis for this. It's not an issue of uh, social and cultural conditioning or uh, keeping up with the Jones family or uh, anything of that kind. Uh, it, our limitless need and desire for wealth can be traced back to our fundamental nature as uh, the rational being. Uh, the distinguishing characteristic of human beings is that they possess the faculty of reason, and uh, reason uh, gives us the potential uh, for a limitless range of knowledge and awareness. Uh, this is addressed in the very uh, first point, uh, reason and the range of knowledge and awareness. Uh, no other species has the uh, kind of range of knowledge and awareness that we do. Uh, your pet, cat, or dog uh, is aware only of what's within his field of sensory perception. So if he can see something, hear it, smell it, uh, anything of that kind, uh, he can be aware of it. But if something is not within his field of sensations or perceptions, uh, he has no awareness. He can't be aware of things that uh, are not perceptually present. Uh, human beings hold knowledge in the form of concepts. Uh, we have had uh, sensory perceptions. Uh, we've seen things, heard things, touched them, smelled them, whatever. And on that basis, we have formed certain concepts. And we retain the concepts. We're able to retain the concepts, uh, even though the things on the basis of which they've been formed are no longer perceptually present. And the concepts will apply uh, to uh, all other uh, members of that uh, class or, or category. And uh, this permits us uh, to take a uh, limitless range uh, of action. Uh, uh, while our pet cat or dog uh, can only act with respect to what he can see or hear or smell, so if he sees a rabbit, he can chase that rabbit. But if the rabbit is no longer around, he can't do anything with respect to the rabbit. But human beings uh, can take action not just with respect to a rabbit, for which they could easily build a trap when there's no rabbit currently around, but uh, we're routinely taking action with respect to events thousands of miles away and many years in the future. And all you have to do to verify that is uh, think of some of the contracts that the firm you work for may have uh, with foreign suppliers or customers and the uh, range of time that those contracts embrace. And uh, we are able to act, as I say, with respect to events far, far distant uh, in, in space and uh, far distant in time. And we have awareness, uh, we, we have awareness of things uh, mm -hmm. from billions of years ago, uh, billions of light years in space. We have an awareness of things from, from subatomic particles uh, to the entire universe, and we can be aware of all kinds of patterns and differences and similarities and relationships uh, that no other species can be aware of. And this uh, limitless potential uh, for knowledge uh, and also uh, awareness, uh, we're aware of things uh, based on this, our limitless potential for knowledge and awareness 
underlies the uh, potential, uh, lim uh, limitless potential for action and experience. Uh, the range of action that we can take, the kinds of experiences that we can have, uh, depend on our range of knowledge and awareness. So uh, we routinely experience things very differently than uh, other species. Uh, if you're playing your favorite music in the presence of your pet, uh, you hear it in a very different way than he hears it. Uh, you can hear uh, rhythms, harmonies, uh, melodies, uh, which the pet can't. Uh, you can look at a picture or, or painting and see it as representing something, and it's uh, not likely that your pet can. Now, uh, if we can hold in mind the proposition that our limitless range of knowledge and awareness uh, gives us the potential for a limitless range of action and experience, uh, the only thing further that we need to realize is that wealth is the uh, material means of, act, of action and experience. Uh, the different forms of wealth that we employ, and I'm not talking about just dollars, I'm talking about actual physical goods. All of the different types of goods that we employ are uh, vital in enabling us to act in the world and uh, have experiences. So. Uh, wealth embraces uh, all categories of tools, implements, machines, uh, and it, to that extent, it's uh, enhancing the power of our arms and legs. Uh, wealth enhances uh, the power of all of our senses. Uh, our eyes are enhanced uh, by eyeglasses, contact lenses, uh, machinery for performing laser surgery. Uh, microscopes, telescopes, and also television sets, uh, DVDs, uh, VCRs, motion pictures. Uh, our hearing is enhanced not only by hearing aids, but also uh, by radio, uh, CD players, uh, before that phonographs. Uh, the power of our uh, thinking is enhanced uh, by books, uh, calculators, computers. And, and so uh, everything we do uh, is enhanced by wealth. And then uh, we have uh, many of our experiences uh, are based on wealth. Uh, wealth is not only instrumentalities, it's also objects of contemplation uh, in the form of works of art, sculpture, landscape grounds, uh, beautiful homes, furniture, uh, clothing. Uh, these are sources of experience. And so uh, there's no limit uh, to our potential for action and experience. Wealth is the material means of action and experience, and I think it follows that uh, there is no limit to our need for wealth, and that, I think, is the basis of why we desire more wealth. And, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Hoffman? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, Steve Kaufman. Hoffman. Kaufman. Kaufman, Kaufman. okay. Came right. Okay. Um, you know, American society tends to like consumption today. Yeah. And versus tomorrow, let's say. Yeah. Do you see that um, the U.S. may lose the technological advantage in the long run because we tend to uh, spend more today instead of um, saving? Okay. Uh, you're asking. Uh, you're observing that uh, people have a very high premium on current consumption. Uh, which implicitly raises the question, what is the status of saving? Uh, and then you're asking further, uh, what implication does this have uh, for uh, an economic situation or technological superiority, productive superiority? Okay, uh, saving is not uh, in contradiction of the desire to consume. Uh, funds that are saved are the foundation of being able to provide for consumption in the future. And uh, it's a question of when do you wish to consume, uh, today or uh, in the future? And uh, you might be very, very old, uh, even if you fully accept the idea of your uh, imminent death, uh, if there are uh, other people alive whom you value, like children or grandchildren, uh, their uh, life and happiness is important to you, and so uh, you derive value from their ability to consume. Now, uh, just let me make an observation about why uh, uh, the accumulation of savings is always tied to the potential to consume. 
uh, imagine that we had a law uh, which said it's unfair for some people to be able to live such a lavish lifestyle that they now do. Uh, no one uh, should be allowed to consume more than, let's say, $100,000 a year. Imagine that we had a law enacted like that and that it was really possible to enforce such a law and it, would remain, it, would, it was expected to remain on the books and be enforced indefinitely. Okay, now, uh, let's suppose we have an individual who's really very, very wealthy. He has accumulated wealth, let's imagine, of $1 billion. All right, what rate of return on capital would you need to secure, uh, uh, or how much capital, how much accumulated wealth would you need to secure an income of just 100000 a year? Do you need a billion dollars? Uh, okay, uh, probably close to a million would do it. If the rate of return were only 5%, then two million would do it. Okay, uh, let's even say the rate of return were 2%. Uh, then, okay, you'd need 10 million, uh, or uh, you'd need 5 million, that 2%, to give you 100,000 a year. And let's assume, and maybe you're afraid you might lose some of the capital you have. So you'd like 10 million to guarantee that uh, you'll always be able to earn 100,000 a year uh, in interest that the government will allow you to consume. All right, what would be the value to you of the remaining uh, 990 million of your billion dollar fortune if there was no way that you could ever possibly touch it for consumption? Nor could your heirs. They would have no value, right? So I think this demonstrates the point that uh, we value savings uh, at least in the name of their potential for our ability to consume. Now, uh, in recent decades, uh, the uh, savings rate of the United States has declined. Uh, it's much lower than that of many other countries. Uh, you'll find that those countries which are very rapidly advancing, uh, such as in Southeast Asia and uh, some of the portions of mainland China, and before that in Japan and South Korea, uh, they all had very, very high savings rates. And saving is the foundation of capital accumulation, which in turn is the foundation of economic progress. So if we uh, persist in saving minimally uh, relative to others, uh, our international position will uh, be undermined. And uh, if we save sufficiently little, uh, not only our relative position, but our absolute position. Uh, every year, uh, whatever capital equipment we have, all the factories, the machinery, uh, the supplies of inventories and so forth, all of these things are continually getting used up in the process of production itself. And the extent to which we produce such goods, including even their replacement, uh, depends on saving. And if we save inadequately, it's possible that we wouldn't even produce enough fully to replace. As of now, we're producing a little bit more than is required just to replace. So we're advancing, but uh, if we carry further uh, the trend we've been on, uh, we won't even be able to replace. And that puts an economy into a downward spiral. So uh, to answer your question, uh, if we persist in a low savings rate, uh, we will certainly not retain uh, economic leadership in the world and very possibly not even our own present standard of living. And uh, these observations uh, have relevance to uh, the developing debate over Social Security, which is increasingly in the news and which I wanted to make it a point at some place to address. Uh, it seems that one of the main issues being left out uh, of the discussion uh, is the effect of Social Security, the Social Security system, on savings. Uh, we hear a lot about proposals to privatize Social Security and what the cost of that might be. And uh, the argument against, uh, in favor of that change is that uh, people would be able to earn a higher rate of return uh, by making uh, their own investments in the stock market or bond market, uh, which I'm sure is a, a legitimate argument. But uh, no one seems to be talking about the effect of the uh, system that's existed for many years on savings. See, so just think 
when people are paying money into the social security system, how are many, if not most of them, regarding their payments in terms of uh, making a provision for their future? They think they're providing for the future. They think they're saving for the future and they have some kind of nest egg. All right, but what, is, what has the government been doing with uh, all of the Social Security taxes that it takes in uh, over and above what it's paying out? It's been spending. It's, it's been spending the whole proceeds, actually. Uh, you see, if you were genuinely saving, imagine we had an annuity company. And here's an annuity company. They're selling annuity policies, and they start selling them uh, mainly to people uh, not yet close to retirement. So they're selling them to people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on. And suppose there were a private annuity company that was taking the annuity payments and uh, using it to finance the, uh, the executives' uh, vacations in the Bahamas or whatever, uh, or build their houses. Uh, where would these people end up? Yeah. They'd go to jail whenever they were found out. Well, now, the Social Security system, from its very beginning, it started collecting uh, Social Security taxes. And uh, from the very beginning, the taxes were expended as a regular part of, of government spending. Now, uh, the Social Security uh, uh, fund, uh, to the extent that they were uh, taking in more than they were currently spending, uh, the excess of what the Social Security system took in above what it paid out, uh, that was put into U.S. government bonds. And people thought, oh, well, that's, uh, that's really a good, solid investment. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now, uh, what happens uh, when the day comes that uh, the payments to recipients exceed the current payroll taxes? What happens uh, to these accumulated bonds? Yeah? Oh, yeah? They have to be sold, right? Now, how would that differ if the government had never put the money into bonds? Uh, they just uh, uh, took in whatever they're taking in, and it's all spent, and there's no claim made that the excess 